Hello and welcome, dear students and other folks who stumble across this video on YouTube. My name is Leonard Obusch. I'm a professor of organization at University of Innsbruck, Austria. And this lecture on digital platforms and information warfare is part of the collaborative open course on organizing in times of crisis, the case of war and armed conflict. In this lecture, the focus will be on new forms of organizing information warfare in the era of digital platform publics. We will be particularly concerned with information warfare beyond the nation state. And again, uh, the war going on in Russia and Ukraine while I'm recording this lecture also offers interesting cases of such new forms of information warfare. Of course, cyber attacks may also be waged by states and their intelligence operations. Something that happened in the course of the Russian invasion of Ukraine as well. The graph here shows a substantial rise in cyber attacks against Ukrainian and Polish civilians with malware or phishing software in early March when the armed conflict started. But also other actors and new virtual battlefields emerged as well. For example, we were witnessing a comeback of what is probably the world's most prominent example of hacker activism or short hacktivism, the collective anonymous. As the New York Times reports in this article, Russia's largest stock exchange, a state-controlled bank and the Russian foreign ministry were taken offline for a time after being targeted by Ukraine's volunteer hackers. However, what interests us in this case is not how the hackers pulled that one off technologically, but how this works organizationally. Because, and this is also a quote from the New York Times articles, um, the article, the hackers came from around the world. They knocked Russian and Ukrainian government websites offline, graffitied anti-war messages onto the home pages of Russian media outlets, and leaked data from rival hacking operations, and they swarmed into chat rooms, awaiting new instructions and egging each other on. Uh, this egging each other on and this assembling and then spreading out from chat rooms, this is actually something that's quite typical for Anonymous and has been typical also in the past. So what Anonymous does, and also this uh, shareable here, is it recruits volunteers from around the world um, and then integrates it in a very loose and very fluid collective uh, that is actually around since 2003, celebrating its 20th birthday uh, in 2023 next year. In this shareable, anonymous activists invite volunteers to protest um, and thereby hiding their identities behind a proxy server and then join into some online collective action. Often, this involves running attack software on your own computer with some scripts, searching for security loopholes, or joining distributed denial of service attacks of websites. This means uh, organizing a large crowd of users, accessing uh, a website at the same time, which then in a way leads to the breakdown of this website. But uh, governmental websites uh, and other Russian websites attacked by hackers are far from the only online battlefield for information warfare affair beyond the nation state that features anonymous online volunteers. Another example is uh, the online or free encyclopedia Wikipedia. There is the saying that the first casualty of war is truth and given the mission of Wikipedia that is providing uh, truthful and neutral statements about encyclopedically relevant subject matters, it is also Wikipedia articles about wars and armed conflicts and about the parties involved that are immediately challenged from various angles, often resulting in so-called added wars that begin with how an article is supposed to be called. For example, in the case of the Russian invasion of Ukraine, it was even contested whether this really was a full-scale invasion or, as the Russian leader prefers to call it, a special security operation. And, as in the case of Anonymous, literally anyone 
is invited to join the good fight and um, to together collaboratively uh, decide and also contribute uh, to uh, the goal of providing accurate, uh, truthful uh, information. So uh, here we can see both Anonymous and Wikipedia, they try to recruit literally anyone from around the world to uh, engage in collaborative uh, activities online that lead to joint outcomes. Uh, and actually what's happening on this virtual battlefield is of high importance. So if we look at uh, the page views of English and Russian Wikipedia pages of uh, both Ukraine, the country, and of its Russian invasion in 2022, we can see how the page views skyrocket as soon as the fighting started. Um, so as you can see, uh, the rest of the world first uh, needed to find out what Ukraine was in the first place at the same time as being uh, interested in uh, the article on the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Um, while the Russian viewers seemingly knew Ukraine very well, so they were not so much interested in the general article on Ukraine, but very much interested in information on the war that was not supposed to be called a war in all of Russian media. And um, if we look behind uh, the scenes of Wikipedia, and I think this is one of the greatest things about Wikipedia, is it, it, it is its radical transparency, which also serves as the main safeguard against attempts of falsification and vandalism. Uh, and when we look at the numbers behind the English language article on the Russian invasion of Ukraine, we can see that over 1,000 people contributed a total of 7,485 edits in about one month's time after the conflict uh, had started. When we compare these numbers to uh, the numbers uh, of the Russian Wikipedia, the Russian language version, on the same topics, um, we can see that um, there have been a similar number of edits on the Russian page, 6,127 in the same time frame to be precise, but only one editor is listed. Of course, there were many more than this one contributor, but to protect those from retaliation by Russian intelligence forces, the Russian language Wikipedia community made an exception from their usual rule of radical transparency. And such worries about retaliation were anything but far-fetched, as the arrest of a Wikipedia editor in Belarus in mid-March of 2022 demonstrated. To quote the article of The Verge on the issue, the main directorate for combating organized crime and corruption of Belarus, a Belarusian uh, security operation, has detained prominent Wikipedia editor Mark Bernstein. The arrest comes after Bernstein's personal information was shared on a public telegram channel of uh, this uh, organized crime unit. So Bernstein, uh, Bernstein is or has been one of the top 50 editors of Russian Wikipedia. So one can see also in virtual battlefields, uh, also in cyber war, information warfare, uh, you might have um, victims and you might have uh, victims that end up in prison or even get killed. So how do they do it? How do, for example, hacker collectives, how do, uh, does also Wikipedia in times of war organize volunteers to contribute, to take part in activities that might be classified as uh, information warfare? So by looking at the two cases of Anonymous and Wikipedia uh, as cases of information warfare beyond the nation state, let's take a closer look uh, and closer organization theoretical look at the question how volunteers may be organized in such contexts. And uh, before we start to apply an organizational theoretical lens, uh, the first issue we need to tackle here is whether Wikipedia and Anonymous even qualify as organizations in the first place. And among the authors that suggested a theoretical framework for capturing unusual forms of organizing are Niels Brunson and Gern Arne uh, in a widely cited article entitled Organization Outside Organizations, 
where they define organization in its most basic form as a form of decided order. In other words, what is necessary for a social formation to be considered organizational is the ability to make some form of collectively binding decisions. Based upon this definition, Brunson and Arne define several constitutive elements of traditional organizations, uh, such as membership, hierarchy, rules, monitoring or sanctions. Here, however, upon a closer look, I would argue that, and compatible with an understanding of organization as a decided order, that all these elements represent some form of rules that in some form of decision making have been uh, agreed upon. Membership rules, for example, govern who is allowed to enter an organization and are traditionally the domain of HR departments. Hierarchy are rules about who has authority over whom in a certain organizational context. Now let's revisit the two cases of Anonymous and Wikipedia in the light of these constitutive elements and how they are resolving uh, the related organizational challenges in an information warfare context. And let's start with the most basic uh, element, that of membership. Um, this uh, first element is already curious in the cases of Anonymous and Wikipedia. How does one become a member of Anonymous and Wikipedia? And uh, I would argue it's mostly about contributing to the collective endeavor and self-identifying as a member. Let's start with Wikipedia, for example. The first and most important step to becoming a member is to start editing Wikipedia. And as most of you will know, in principle, just by clicking the edit button, anyone without even the need to log in can start contributing. Here you can see an example of the Wikipedia page on Austria, my home country. And if you click on edit, without any need to log in, you can start and change the article and can add information. Why have I chose, uh, chosen Austria as an example? Uh, because, and this brings us back into the situation uh, of war between Russia and Ukraine, uh, if we look at the similar article uh, on uh, the, uh, the Ukrainian article, uh, you will see that it's not so easy to edit this article. Yeah? And this is actually a general strategy of Wikipedia, uh, that articles dealing with a controversial topic, such as an ongoing war, are often uh, temporarily closed uh, for users that are not logged in. This is, for example, what was the case for the article on Ukraine at the time when I was compiling this lecture, as compared to the page of Austria, my home country, which was seemingly uncontroversial enough to remain open for anyone to edit. What um, you can also do at Wikipedia is you cannot just edit it yourself, but what you can also do is you can have a look who else edited it. Yeah? And um, when we uh, stick to the issue of membership, uh, probably not, not everyone contributing to Wikipedia would consider his or herself a member. Just because you correct, correct a typo does not make you a Wikipedian. The majority of edits to the Wikipedia, however, are contributed by accounts with a login. The overwhelming majority uh, of which use a pseudonym and not their full or true name. So when we look at the editing history uh, of uh, a Wikipedia page, what we find is <coughs> a list of pseudonyms who contributed to the article, either by deleting sequences or by adding sequences of information to it. Um, this is then again a parallel uh, to the other case we are looking at, the case of Anonymous where pseudonyms are important as well. So here you can see an example of a pirate pad, a collaborative online text editing tool used to prepare what was, what was supposed to be an anonymous operation targeting Facebook. And as you can see on the right hand side, uh, contributors were using pseudonyms, not real names. But why does the difference between anonym, anonymity and pseudonymity matter so much? I would argue it makes all the difference. And this brings us to the next element of organization, which is hierarchy. In both cases, even though one anonymous has no formal organizational structures at all, we can observe the emergence of more or less clear hierarchies over time. Uh, 
Key for hierarchies to emerge, however, is the contribution history of individuals. A history which can only turn into a hierarchy because of the use of pseudonyms. Uh, in the case of Wikipedia, this leads to an explicit hierarchy. In the case of Anonymous, it leads to an informal hierarchy. Let's now start with Anonymous uh, and uh, with a quote of a self-declared anonymous activist I did an interview with in a research project uh, and who told me how um, operations, that's how activities by anonymous are often called, how they are started. Uh, anonymous comprises partly from teams which coordinate via IRC, which is short for Internet Relay Chat, or other multi-user tools. It is there where most of the promising operations emerge from. So here we see not re no, no real hierarchy. We see people coming together and co using collaborative tools online to come up with ideas for uh, an operation. But to kickstart an operation and to attract hacktivists, Anonymous also, if not mostly, depends on being promoted by some of the larger social media accounts associated with the collective, such as Anonops or your Anon News, with 282,000 followers and over 8 million followers, respectively. Why did those accounts acquire so many followers? Because in the past, their announcements led to successful operations, which increases the likelihood of attracting a critical mass of supporters in future operations as well. So we have an informal hierarchy, which partly manifests in different follower accounts of social media accounts controlled by members of Anonymous. So if you can see here, uh, Anon Ops and uh, your Anon News, they have quite different follow accounts. And one could say the one is hierarchically above the other because it commands a much bigger following that might be turned into activists. In the case of Wikipedia, the hierarchy is much more explicit and operationalized via various levels of user access. Here you can see the hierarchy of user access levels explicitly listed on Wikipedia itself. However, similar to Anonymous, a necessary condition for getting promoted is a history of successful edits, which have been approved by the community. A certain number of edits can directly lead to higher user access levels or be a necessary condition to run for roles of, for example, administrators, who can then, for example, also delete articles. And this power to delete an article brings us to the next element of organization we uh, want to take a look at, which is monitoring. The different roles in Wikipedia, but also the question who decides whether an operation using the anonymous label is legitimate or not. In both cases, we find self-monitoring practices in a form that I would call peer review. At Anonymous, for a long time, peer review happened on image boards such as 4chan, where anyone can post things and after a certain amount of time, uh, pictures, texts, videos, and after a certain amount of time, they get deleted again. So it's very a very ephemeral space. And this is also where the name Anonymous, the default name for contributors on this image board, originated from. Again, an anonymous hacktivist describes how this works. Out of principle, anytime someone proposes an operation, the next 20 postings will be like, that is total crap. Then comes the point when you are called to deliver, which means docs or uh, GTFO. Show what you've got or get the fuck off. So um, we can see people suggesting operations in these boards. There are peers, potential anonymous activists who judge and then in the end decide whether they will join, join the raid, as anonymous called it, or uh, whether they will just uh, do nothing and let the operation die. At Wikipedia, again, the peer review, review process is much more formalized, for example, by developing a set of explicit notability criteria that any Wikipedia article must meet to count as encyclopedically relevant. But still, its peers, its other Wikipedia um, editors, who are supposed to judge uh, whether uh, notability criteria are met or an article article has to be deleted again, which brings us to our final element, which is sanctions. So while both Anonymous and Wikipedia use peer review practices to self-monitor, 
they have different ways to sanction behavior that violates their unwritten, in the case of Anonymous, and written in the case of Wikipedia rules. In Wikipedia, sanctions include deletion of contributions and even blocking of uh, usernames, pseudonyms, Anonymous. Uh, this is different because there is no joint platform that is used. So actually, what's necessary is some forms of excommunication or doxing, meaning to share um, difficult uh, to, difficult to obtain documents with, for example, private information on a certain individual. We come back. We will come back to that. In the case of Wikipedia, researchers around Dario Tabarelli have taken the sometimes escalating uh, deletion discussions as an opportunity to come up with a nice visualization. Depending on whether an argument is for or against deletion, the branch leans to the left or to the right. In this picture here, you can only see discussions about articles that were ultimately not deleted. So it shows that these decisions are by no means just about simple majorities. Even if the branch leans to the right, the article can still survive. And leaning to the right means there are more uh, contributions demanding the deletion of an article. Still, the article had been kept. This, in turn, is what the tree looks like for 100 deletion discussions with the most posts that resulted in the deletion of the article. And here you can see it's much more skewed to the right. Uh, so one could see it's easier to be kept even if a majority is for deletion, but it's much harder uh, to be deleted if the majority is for an article to be kept. In case anyone was wondering what happened to the article in Wikipedia on Smurf communism, it survived. In uh, the case of Anonymous, um, there's a question that regularly arises. Uh, because if anyone can speak for Anonymous, who can't speak for Anonymous? And how is someone sanctioned who speaks for Anonymous but is not supposed to speak for Anonymous? So, again, quoting an Anonymous activist I did an interview with, um, he argues that how it works at Anonymous is we claim responsibility responsibility for cool operations even if we weren't responsible for them in case an operation fails we don't so this further complicates the situation yeah that uh, the denial of responsibility may well be strategically motivated and vice versa so so when we uh, look at the growing number of operations attributed to anonymous over time so this is actually a picture of the first 10 years of anonymous um, and we can see that in the first phase, there were very few uh, operations attributed to uh, Anonymous. And then in what is here um, depicted as phase three, the number of operations really took off. And uh, so with the number of potentially um, op operations potentially attributed to Anonymous rising, um, also, the number of contested cases where it was unclear whether Anonymous was actually responsible also uh, rose. Uh, still, only a minority of uh, operations was contested. Uh, but so, how has uh, then this um, contestation uh, been resolved uh, in these unclear cases? And let me give you one example how this worked. And one such case was an operation called Op. Facebook announced in August 2011. So here in a press release, someone stated that attention citizens of the world, your medium of communication you also dearly adore will be destroyed. And, uh, you know, um, announcing that um, Facebook will go down in history on November 5, 2011. Why November 5? This is um, a, a specific date relating to the Guy Fox. Um, conspiracy in England and many anonymous activists use Guy Fox masks so this date was not choose, uh, chosen uh, by accident here and what happened is that shortly after this press release had been announced uh, one of the anonymous accounts that I uh, already mentioned earlier and on ops um, uh, he uh, this account in all caps denounced the operation operation as illegitimate writing to the press medias of the world stop lying up facebook is just another fake 
we don't kill the messenger that's not our style however um, only a few hours later the same day anon ops felt the need to self-correct uh, without using all caps that time stating that op facebook is being organized by some anons this does not necessarily mean that all of anonymous agrees with it so we can see it was unclear whether op facebook is or should be considered a legitimate anonymous operation and actually there was a long period of about um, yeah close to half a year from august until the alleged date for the operation to start november 5 that it was not clear whether this should be considered a legitimate anonymous operation or not but what then happened on november 4th so the day before the operation was supposed to start is that um, someone published the full name, address, phone number, and email address of the person allegedly responsible for the operation, thereby effectively excommunicating him. Because if you're known by name, you can hardly claim to be a member of Anonymous anymore. Of course, this was not an easy feat, and this required preparation, and uh, it, wa it was far from an ordinary uh, communicative act. So this brings me to uh, the conclusions. What can we learn from this case comparison, from looking at these um, cases in the context of information warfare beyond the nation state? First of all, uh, I would say that non-state actors in information warfare are hard to contain with traditional intelligence repertoires, but at the same time, they are hard to control for any side in armed conflicts. Um, if we look at the specific cases of Anonymous and Wikipedia, we find that even though they are quite atypical, they still comprise all elements of traditional organizations. However, they heavily rely on pseudonymity on the one hand and precariously asymmetric boundaries on the other hand. Why these two characteristics are, why are they so important? Pseudonymity is key because on the one hand, it protects the individual identity from repression, from real-world repression in um, the context of information warfare and armed conflict. But at the same time, and that's different to mere anonymity, it allows contribution-based hierarchies to emerge. So the whole social structuring of these organizations depends on attributing past contributions to pseudonyms, pseudonyms in terms of uh, Wikipedia usernames or pseudonyms in terms of, for example, social media um, accounts on Twitter or Facebook or other social networks uh, in the case of Anonymous. Boundaries, in turn, in both cases, are asymmetrically drawn ex post after the fact, uh, which makes these organizations very open and easy to join. So you can become a part of the organization without anyone else to agree, just by contributing to the collaborative and collective efforts of these organizations. At the same time, this also makes the boundaries of the organization necessarily precarious, requiring additional efforts to police and re-establish them. In the case of Wikipedia, for example, with an elaborate and ever-growing set of rules and also software measures um, you know, to have uh, actually different levels of boundaries and openness in terms of who is allowed to contribute. In the case of Anonymous, it's much more uh, the efforts needed to um, re-establish boundaries once they are in doubt. So, thank you very much for watching this lecture until the very end. Uh, I hope uh, it took some interesting insights with you. In case questions arise, please feel free to contact me.